Jeremiah chapter 31 and from verse 31. With God's word open before us, can I just ask you to stand in a word of prayer and for the reading of God's word, please. Precious heavenly God, our great and mighty King, we come in that wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. We just thank you for your precious love and your mercies. Oh Lord, just remembering the great things that you have done for us, that which you have accomplished for us, oh Lord God, and on our behalf. Oh Lord, nothing that we could have done, but just accept, oh Lord, the great things that you have done for us. And we just reminded again and again, oh Lord, of your precious love and mercies, your promises to your children, and we are so very grateful. This morning as we come to you, Lord God, just ask that you would open your word to us. Speak to us, please, O oh Lord God. Just remove the things that you don't want said, Lord God. And just please, Lord, bring to remembrance those things that are in your word, O oh Lord. And may it find an abiding place in our hearts. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we thank you again for your wonderful grace. We thank you for your wonderful love and mercies. We bless you this day. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, and we're going to read from verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. God bless you. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, we continuing with the uh, study, and I think this is the third part in the study of the covenants. Uh, and we just remember the precious covenant that God made with Abraham. It's so wonderful and you find it filtering right through the scriptures. And uh, this covenant that God made to Abraham was just so very beautiful. I will make you a great nation. When the man had no children, God tells him, I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to make you a great nation. Nations shall come out of, thy, out of thee. Didn't have a child. Lord, I'm battling. It says you will have kings coming out of you. I will give you the land. I'll give you everything. I'll give you a great inheritance. And then he falls and he says, well, but yeah, I, I don't know. How shall I know this? And it's just so beautiful how God just takes him through all of these things. And we know that it was a faith of Abraham that led him through many of these things. But before the covenant with Abraham, we go and we see this covenant that God made with the earth and with Noah and the living creatures. And it says, when God made this covenant, he put the rainbow in the sky, he put a bow in the sky, and he says, the waters shall no more become a flood unto thee to destroy all the flesh. And we find that in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 15. And God puts this rainbow, he says, no more is the, is the waters coming as a flood to destroy all of the earth. And we take, we take refuge in that and we see this, see this rainbow and it's so beautiful. And God says, I will look on the rainbow and I will remember my covenant as well. But also what we need to reflect on 
when we see the rainbow, we need to also reflect that the waters did come and it did judge the world for their corruption. That the Lord did destroy the earth. People are using this as a sign, but brothers and sisters, what sign? To do more corruption? We must just be very careful. That rainbow was put there. And the waters as a flood will not destroy the earth. But God is coming in with a greater judgment because the wickedness is just increasing and increasing. We need to come out of our wicked state. Because God is a just God. And if he leaves something unpunished, then he's not just at all. If he leaves the sin to grow and grow and doesn't do anything about it, then he's not just. So God will come in because he is a just God. and He will punish. We take it just before that. We go back to Adam. And many people look at the, uh, when it comes to Adam, and they say God had made a covenant with him. I didn't start there as a covenant. But yes, God told Adam, you will rule everything. The earth, all of these things that I've created, you're going to be the highest in the land. You're going to rule. But there's just one thing that I want you to do. Is don't eat of that tree. And we find that Adam sinned. Adam made a mistake. <laughs> the man fell. Because God said, the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Man fell, and we find that no man lived beyond that thousand years. God says a day is like a thousand years, and no man has lived beyond that thousand years. Because God fulfills his word. You will replenish the earth, you will look after it, yes, but you won't live beyond that thousand years, because a day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and you will die the same day. You will die in that thousand years. No man will. And we find Methuselah came very close. 969 years. But just that few years more, God couldn't take him. He had to let him go before that. You see, but God there already, there is a judgment for sin there already in the Garden of Eden. And he says to the woman, and he brings this punishment, and he says, you shall bear, and there will be sorrow, and all of these things. He says to Adam, you will, by the sweat of your brow, you shall eat bread. You're going to do all of these things. But he says to the serpent, you will bruise his heel, but he shall bruise thy head. That judgment time came in from there already. And God is not only going to bruise, uh, bruise his head, for that final time he will be cast into that fire which God has prepared for him and the people who don't accept the salvation that God gives, which is a free gift of salvation to all those who believe in him. You see, Adam sinned. Adam means man. So man sinned. Right? So through man was going to be salvation as well. Because man was first created and he had this eternal life. But because he sinned, he fell. But man is going to bring in eternal life. But God is not a man. So how on earth does eternal life come in? Because man fell. It took another man to bring in that eternal life because the animal sacrifices could cover their sin. Yes, God would, would look through that and see the blood, and see the shed blood, but man had sinned. And through man is going to come redemption, but there was no man that was, that was able to bring redemption. This takes us back to the Levitical law of redemption. See, brothers and sisters, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 to 23. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And just the verse before that. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. God in his mercy took on a body of flesh. He came and he dwelt among us. God himself became a man. He tabernacled with us and he paid the price for man's redemption. So as in Adam all die. As in man. Adam means man. As in Adam all die. Through man came the resurrection of the dead, which is from God himself becoming a man, taking on our son. So all of these things, what was it doing? It was pointing. It was pointing to someone greater, something that's going to happen, all the while pointing there. Right from the start. God was going to deal with sin, but he's going to deal with it in a way where he had to take that penalty. So that which is from him, which was eternal life, eternal life only exists in God. But he was going to impart that eternal life to those who believe in him. So God makes a covenant. From there we move on and then we find that uh, it came from there, it went to Abraham. And then we go, uh, I'm going to skip one, and we go to the covenant that God made with David. And we read about that in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7, just very quickly there. I don't want to, I need to get to the new covenant that the Lord is speaking about. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 14 to 16. We'll read from verse 13. So God makes a covenant with David. And he says to David, He shall build my, he will build an house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is talking about the son of David. Right? And he says, He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, no man is going to live forever. But the son of David is going to live forever. And I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. Now, who was chastened with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men? Christ took on Christ Jesus took that stripes that we were healed with. He took on the punishment that was ours. Right? So when we have committed the iniquity, but the Lord had laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53. The Lord had laid on him the iniquity of, our, of us all. But my mercy, verse 15, but my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul when I put away, whom I put away before, before thee. And the throne of, uh, and thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now, this is talking about the son of David that was still going to come which is Christ Jesus. He came in as the son of David. We find that when the angel came to Mary, he's talking about in the line, this is the house of David. And we find that Mary and Joseph were of the lineage of David. But remember, 
Joseph had nothing to do with the birth of Jesus except that he had to keep Mary as his wife until, uh, well, for, forever, but, uh, and, and not have any relationship with her until that covenant child was born, which was Jesus Christ. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. This is God tabernacling, tabernacling with us. He came and he tabernacled with us. God came down. His name was Emmanuel. I'm going to take you to the one before that. And let's just first go into the book of Hebrews. We find here, even there, this was now talking uh, and it was pointing to someone greater, right? And this was Jesus Christ. Let's go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 from verse 10. It says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. This sounds very much like the passage that we started with in Jeremiah. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And when God comes in, this is still from the book of Jeremiah, the quotation from there. And he says, but there's coming something greater. It's pointing, it's pointing all the while to say there's coming something greater. I'm going to write my laws in their hearts that they will know me as the God. I will remember their sins no more. God just doesn't forget your sins. He remembers it no more. You see, when you forget something, you can bring it back. To, somewhere, somehow, it comes back to mind. But he remembers it no more. It's all covered. It's taken away, basically. All with the blood of Jesus, right? And we go on to chapter 9, verses 14 to 16. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot. Now there's so much in this verse. There is, there is a ton that's in this verse, brothers and sisters. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, who is this eternal spirit? It's God himself, right? So we find here, this is God himself. This is the eternal spirit. But he had to make himself a body. He had to become Adam, the last Adam. That's why we call Christ the last Adam in scripture. Because Adam means man. So he's coming in as that man who would pay for our sin. But it's through the eternal spirit. Offered himself without spot, without any, any sin. As that lamb that was slain to take away sin, it had to be a pure lamb representing, pointing to that which was to come. So here Christ offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, 
he is a mediator of a new testament, a new covenant. So he becomes a mediator, Christ becoming the man, became as that eternal God, and as the man, he stands in the middle, so he's on a cross that's suspended between heaven and earth. He's not, when he was on the cross, he was not on the earth because there was something that was suspended there. And then you got the heavens and he is on the cross, becoming the mediator of a better covenant, of a new testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that is under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We are going to receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That eternal God is giving us an inheritance. So he is making a new covenant, a new testament with us, giving us eternal life. But, and verse 16 says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all. While the testator yet liveth. While the testator liveth. If you make a will and a testament, and you say, this goes here and that goes there, I leave to my children this and that, it's usually when I die, I want this to go there and I want that to go there and that to go there. But while I'm living, it's not in force. So Christ, he had to take his death in order for us to have this inheritance which he has prepared for his children. And we go back and we look at the Moses. And God looks at Abraham and he's, he tells Abraham, you're going to be a great nation and I'm going to work with your son Isaac and then afterwards I'm going to work with that particular son which is Jacob and then Jacob's 12 tribes and we know that Joseph gets into the land and he's in the land and he's in afterwards someone who comes in and he doesn't know Joseph and he forgets about all that and he makes them slaves. So they're slaves in this land and they were there for 400 years just serving pharaohs and, the Egypt, and Egypt. God remembers his covenant that he made to Abraham and says, calls out uh, Moses and he says, Moses, I need you to go into the land of Egypt and deliver my people, bring them out of slavery. But we, we know, I'm, I'm not going to get into that at, the, uh, at this time. We, we actually went through that already, and you can go back and have a look at that. And then he says to Moses, I want you to slay a lamb. I'm going to want you to take the blood of this lamb and apply it on the doorposts, on the upper doorposts and the two side posts. That will be the sign. That will be the sign of who my people are. That is going to be the sign. And anyone who doesn't have that blood applied to the doorpost is going to be a death in the household. And I want you, Moses, to keep that covenant. You will tell the people every year, year after year, I want you to tell the people they need to do this. This one Passover meal because I redeemed you, I took you out of death and I brought you into life. You will keep this covenant of mine and you will remember it with that Passover lamb. Year after year after year you're going to do it. I rescued you from bondage and you're going to do this thing. The blood on the doorpost was a sign that you are mine. And Jesus comes in in the book of Luke, celebrating this Passover. Luke chapter 22. And 
this time of the Passover. Verse 19. If we can just read the first verse of Luke chapter 22. It says, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. So here we just, we just go on to verse 19. It says, now the, Jesus, and he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood which is shed for you. Jesus comes in there and he's coming to this most sacred time of the Passover and he takes and he's celebrating this with the disciples and he says, this bread, he breaks the bread and he says, this bread, this is my body which is broken for you. He takes the cup and he says, this is the New Testament which is sealed in my blood. This is the New Testament. This is the new covenant that I'm giving you. Not that old covenant anymore. And it's my blood that you're going to celebrate from now on. Don't do that. The sacrifices had ceased. The ultimate was here. You see, brothers and sisters, this is a new covenant that God is giving to his children. When we read in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we look at these things and we say, how beautiful. Oh, it's talking about this Jesus Christ being born. Yes, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. That's not the baby. And to us, a son is given on the cross. That son was given to us on that cross. That was Calvary. That bride, that Adam, you see, Adam, when God wanted to make a bride for himself, he took from his side a rib and he formed this woman as a bride for Adam. God coming on that cross. You see, no bone of that lamb that they used to take. It had to be without spot. It had to be without blemish, without any physical defects. And when they killed that lamb as well, no bone of that lamb was to be broken. And so they come to Christ on the cross and they say, oh, this, is, this, this crucifixion is going to take a long time. And here we, we're celebrating the Passover today. We can't have this on the cross. We've got to take him, we've got to take him down. Break the legs. No problem. They go to the first one, they break his legs. The other person that was crucified on the other side, they break his leg and they come to Jesus and he says, oh, you have instructions, you've got to break the legs. And those Roman soldiers didn't take any nonsense. They were going to do what they were instructed to do and that's it. But they come there to Jesus and they say, oh, he's already dead. And they pierce his side and out flowed blood and water. No bone was broken. But outflowed blood and water. He died of a broken heart for you and for me. From that side, brothers and sisters, that blood flowed. If you apply that blood to your life and become a child of God, you become the bride of Jesus Christ. No more do you have to pay for your own sin. You're relying on Jesus Christ and that new covenant of what he has done for you and for me. 
What do you do? I accept it, Lord. I accept it. That's what I need to do. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. Still at that Passover. It says, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit, of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus says, I've been longing to drink this with you. I've been longing to, to celebrate this Passover meal with you so that I could explain to you what it's all about. And he says, but now I'm not going to drink this anymore with you until I drink it again in my Father's kingdom. You see, brothers and sisters, this is very much like a Jewish marriage. And a Jewish marriage, when a person, when they were betrothed to one another, uh, when you meet someone and you fall in love or whatever it is, and you, you get together and you say, all right, we're making a covenant promise. We're going we're gonna to get married. And they betrothal, and then the bridegroom says to the bride, he drinks wine with her and he says to her, not going to drink of this wine again until I drink it with you in our marriage covenant. When we get married, I will drink that with you. In the meantime, I'm going to prepare a place at my father's house. So alongside his father's house, he will build himself something there. A place for his bride. And in the meantime, while he's gone away, maybe it takes a year or whatever it takes. The bride, the bride has to prepare herself for this marriage feast. So she prepares herself for the marriage feast. The bridegroom is going to prepare the house or whatever else he has to do to get his bride in there. And then in the meantime, what he does is he normally sends a present Something to beautify the bride, something to help the bride, something to do, some, and then he sends a gift by the hand of one of his trusted servants. Oh, okay, go there, give this to the bride. Just know that I'm, I'm coming for her. I will come and I will take her one of the days. And with a great trumpet sound, whatever it is, he comes in usually at night and he takes, ah, there's the wedding feast. There's the bride and the bridegroom coming together. And there's so much of what Christ said. John chapter 14. Just so much. I'll go and prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I will take you to be with me. Where I am, there he may be also. And what did he do? He sent his Holy Spirit, the comforter, to get ready his bride. Something, make beautiful of his bride. Yes, brothers and sisters, he's coming with that trumpet sound. He's coming again, and he will take his children away. You see that first, when John records, he says, this is the beginning of miracles. What was it? The beginning of miracles. The wedding in Cana where he takes, the wa he takes water, he turns it into wine. And then you find in, in, in Revelation chapter 19, Revelation chapter 19, verse 9, it says, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Lord is there. He's going to drink that wine with us. He's going to celebrate with us. And it's all sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. What he has done for us on that cross. Nothing less, and we don't need anything more. How shall you know him? You will know him. I'm just reminded yesterday, I was just reminded again of that one song. It just came to mind. You will know him by the nail prints on his hands. That's what he did for you and for me to seal that covenant, brothers and sisters, with his own prayer.
precious blood. Let's pray. Let us pray. Father, our God and our King, we are so grateful and we will forever be grateful, eternally grateful for that covenant that you have made for us all. And Lord Jesus, we just take refuge in that which you have done for us. So appreciating all of these things. We want to say we love you, Lord. You are the bridegroom. We are the bride. We are your children. Oh, Lord God, let your Holy Spirit just make us more beautiful, more acceptable to you, O oh Lord, our God and King. Let your Holy Spirit dwell in us, more of you, O oh Lord God, to be set apart from the world and the things of this world. Lord Jesus, help us, O oh Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray.